everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, this is a really exciting time uh, for, for this field. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to give you a little overview. Uh, I was asked to speak on this topic from my perspective, and on the way over here, I was reminded by this famous quote from Isaac Asimov that predicting the future is a hopeless and thankless task. But, but I have 10 full minutes, so this is going to be wonderful. Um, I want to start, and I think talking about the future, it's critical to talk about and ground yourself in the present and also a little bit of the past. So I want to start with that and say that I believe firmly that our species is in the midst of a crisis right now. And not just the external one that we've inflicted upon our planets, but an internal one, a crisis of our minds, what I call a cognition crisis. When it comes to both enhancing and even understanding our cognition, we're tragically lacking. And I'm defining that very broadly. Attention, memory, perception, reasoning and decision making, our emotional regulation, imagination, creativity, empathy, compassion, wisdom. And we're paying a great price for that. So in addition to the half a billion people around our planet that are suffering debilitating deficits of cognition, this is a crisis that touches us all, right? So our limitations in analytical decision-making and long-term thinking and empathic concern are plain to see just by reading uh, the papers and you know, the daily news. So I would say that we need to position the goal of enhancing human cognition on par with other pressing global priorities, right? We need to embrace this, we need to up-level our minds. Today, the current paradigm is that there is a pill that will cure our ailing minds. We just need to find it, but we will find it, right? This is the promise of molecular medicine, and although it has had success in many fields, in this world, brain and mind, it has failed us. It's failed to meet our expectations and the needs. And so over the last 15 years, I've been devoting my time to advancing this work of experiential medicine. Now, this is not a new concept. The idea that we, as humans, build, create, target, ritualize experiences as medicine is thousands of years old, right? A central tenet of ancient widespread practices of meditation is actually release of suffering from unhealthy states, stress, fear, grief, craving, and clinging. The idea behind why experiential medicine can have a renaissance now is technology. Technology has this amazing opportunity to deliver experiences to us. Now, this is the domain of digital therapeutics, and I am not going to cover the breadth of experiences that can be created with technologies. That is a much, much longer talk. But I'm just gonna focus on one that I've been working on for 15 years because I think it has a unique potential to truly create personalized, targeted, scalable, and testable experiences that lead to change, and that is the closed loop experience. So the closed loop experience is a very unique experience to have. It's one in which your environment is being constantly updated in real time based upon your state in the moment. So let's just break this down for a moment. So here's your brain interacting either passively or actively with some digitally delivered experience, and metrics are captured, um, your stress, your emotions, your performance, just to name some. That's fed into a processor that then feeds back to you an environment that is updated in a personalized way to give you sensations, challenges, and rewards, all to create that based upon your own experience. And this is an incredible place for machine learning. I'm gonna come back to that role right over here. So it is the nature of these interactions that activate brain networks selectively. It's something that we've never accomplished with any other approach before, not with a drug, not with brain stimulation, only experiences activates the brain in that way. And it is the nature of the closed loop system to apply constant pressure to those underlying networks, harnessing our brain's inherent plasticity to improve itself. So this is the very basis of that. Now, I've had um, 15 years, as I said, so starting in 2008, 1,000 feet in that direction, I had this idea of building a video game to improve attention in seniors. I worked with friends at LucasArts to create this game, NeuroRacer. After development and five years of research, we published it in this wonderful journal, Nature, in 2013. A month ago was a decade since this, so this is a long story. And what we showed here is that we can improve attention and working memory in the game, outside of the game, excuse me, and that it had durable effects, and we recorded brain activity to understand those basic mechanisms. Over the last 12 years, 
We've now moved that technology, translated outside of this university, which actually owns the IP behind it, to a company I co-founded called Achille. And it is now, this is like maybe one of the first times I've been on a stage saying that this is in the past as opposed to the future. We now have FDA approval for the first video game ever. This is a class two medical device. It was the, a de novo pathway for bringing this game to the world as a medical treatment for children with ADHD. Super excited. I talked about that for many years before it happened. <laughs> happened right in the middle of COVID. That along with my daughter were like the silver linings of that horrible period of time. So this is great, but it's been three years now since this game has emerged as a completely new treatment uh, for this condition. Um, how are things going? First, I'd like to say that it works. We've had over 20,000 prescriptions across all 50 states, doctors prescribing a video game to children with ADHD. And the response is incredible, and you know it doesn't work for everyone, but we are very pleased with what we were seeing. However, that is not fast enough to keep a company healthy. And we've learned that as well as others in the space. And the big barrier there is insurance reimbursement. So the data's out there. Medical devices, not just digital devices, have the, the average, even the majority of time between approval and reimbursement of over five years. Now, if you're a giant company that could just write off that loss and make it up later, that's fine. If you're anywhere uh, away from that domain, it is a valley of death. We heard about another valley of death of leaving academics, like we survived that one, and this is another one. The only other company that got FDA approval for a digital therapeutic before Achille um, did so in a different domain, not video games, cognitive behavioral therapy, went bankrupt this year trying to push through that barrier of insurance reimbursement. So this is one of the things I want to tell you about the future. It's figuring out not just how to create and validate new technologies, which is so important and there's so much need now. Need and a product that works is not enough, right? We need new models to move products that are very safe to people in need, especially people that don't have money. And that was really created that very impenetrable barrier for us and other companies. Uh, so how do we do that? We released a new product, an over-the-counter product, Endeavor OTC, for adults based upon our data in adults and the emerging um, larger population of adults that have ADHD. And this is giving us a really positive signal. It's a completely different company. It is a pivot from a prescription product requiring doctors to be in the loop and insurance companies to be able to pay the cost of having prescription processing to a direct-to-consumer so that people are taking their own health into their hands and, and accessing treatments that they need. We've had over 200,000 downloads in our first four months, so there's definitely a signal that this works, but it is a complicated domain um, of moving these treatments through this pathway. There is another pathway, the wellness pathway, uh, where you do not have clinical claims, and understanding how to manage this is just really tricky. I mean, I've probably been asked this question at least 10 times over the last two days since I've been here. We don't have the answers, but this is an area that the future needs to change um, if we're going to help all these people in need. I think we all recognize that. So it is a discussion point, it is not an answer, but breaking down the barriers between what we think is wellness and what we think is clinical and how to get these treatments to people is something that we need to figure out. Okay, that's, that's the reality of the business situation. Now I wanna use my last minute and a half and talk about the stuff that's more fun for me of where we're going with this field in terms of technology and science. So let's go back to the closed loop. The closed loop that we use in Endeavor is pretty basic, right? We're recording the data that's going in is just your performance data, the accelerometer, the tap screen, your response time, your accuracy, and the output is presented on a 2D tablet or a phone. Great for accessibility, but not great for immersion. So the areas that we're, we're working in here at Neuroscape that many others are, are capturing rich, comprehensive physiological data. We call this multimodal biosensing. A thousand feet in that direction, our lab has moved over the last 15 years. On that side, we have a system of almost 180 electrodes collecting this data using advances in biosensor technology, signal processing, and machine learning to be able to gather and interpret this data, make meaningful 
um, under, have a meaningful understanding of your state in the moment, your arousal, your attention, your awareness, your valence, and then use that data actionably to guide much more immersive experiences using not just advances in VR and AR, but ways of capturing how you see, smell, feel, and hear environments that are being presented to you. So that is also going on right in a new lab that we built during COVID. So, this is where we're heading. We're heading to this future of using all these new technologies, many of which are positioned in the entertainment and communication space to have new solutions for our ailing minds. And just to conclude, we have this opportunity, and we all talk about AI. I call this side of it interpretive AI. How do we understand the state of a person so rapidly? We're not creating anything. We're just trying to understand complex, dynamic data over time. And then how might we use generative AI to build these environments adaptively? So this is sort of a bit of a science fiction future of using these tools, but I think that this is going to be where digital therapeutics are heading. And then ultimately is not thinking about these in silos, that's been a big mistake in the pharmaceutical world, but really bringing together the best thoughts and real world experiences like meditation, music, dance, art, and story so that we can create um, more powerful experiences that use the ancient wisdom that we've all collected. And then, how do we integrate this with our current molecular medicines? They're not bad. There's nothing conceptually wrong with the idea of using a molecule to enhance the mind. The challenge is that we built a silo around it. We could integrate it with this, lower our doses, decrease our side effects, and possibly create a synergistic effect that takes us to a greater outcome. And then, of course, I would be remiss not to include a very interesting pharmaceutical, which are these, psychedelics. I think these are incredibly well positioned as being experiential medicines in their own right to integrate with this world. And this is exactly what we're working on at Neuroscape to lead to a future where we don't just think of any of these as solving the problem, but look at how they interact together. So we need to do better, right? But we can do better. I'm super excited about the future. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention.